<laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, in terms of uh, the running order, I have, uh, so uh, the excellent Julie McCanny will be coming up and making opening remarks. Uh, she is the Associate Professor professor in Department of Hematology and Blood Transfusion at the Muhabili University of Health and Allied Sciences and is Principal Investigator of Sickle Cell in Africa Clinical Coordinating Center. She is also the Provost Visiting Professor of, professor of Hematology at Imperial College London. Uh, then the main body of talk is being given by the incredible Jennifer Adair, who is the Clinical Research Division Principal Investigator of the Adair Lab at the Fred Hutchison Center uh, Research Center and the Fleischhauer um, Family Endowed Chair in Gene Therapy Transfusion. She is also uh, Associate Professor of the Division of Medical Oncology at the University of Washington School of Medicine and is the co-founder of the Global Gene Therapy Initiative. Um, we will then have some remarks from Baba Anusa, who is the national he chair of the National Hemoglobinopathy Panel and lead consultant at the Evelina Children's Hospital in London, part of Guy's and St. Thomas's, and the principal investigator of the Arise Network. And then remarks from uh, Professor Caroline Kuschenbacher, who is uh, from Genomics England and is a professor of genetic epidemiology mental health uh, neuroscience at University College London and the scientific lead for diverse data at Genomics England. Like I said, we'll then have the discussion and the uh, possibility of people being able to ask questions both online and in the room. And then the closing remarks will come from Professor Tassos Karadimitrios, who is co-director of the Center of Hematology um, professor of uh, Hematology at uh, Imperial College London and the Langmuir Chair and Director of the Hugh and Jocelyn Langmuir Centre for Myeloma Research. So thank you everyone for joining today. It's really appreciated. And at uh, this juncture, I'll hand over to Julie. Uh, you can wear it as well. Okay, um, where's the, hello everyone. So my name is Julie Makani as introduced by Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. And um, greetings to everyone. Thank you for everyone who's come here in person and thank you for all of those who've joined online. So it's really a pleasure to um, host Jennifer and um, Adam, Baba, Carolina for um, the talk today. And what we really want to share with you is the activities um, that have been ongoing as part of the Global Gene Therapy Initiative. It's really um, pertinent for the work that is ongoing here at, the, um, at Imperial College London and the Hammersmith Hospital, because this is a place where they have been doing a lot of transplant and for a lot of the ex vivo gene therapy um, work that is ongoing that you hear or that you will hear about, um, it requires um, bone marrow transplant as a platform. The approach that we've taken in Tanzania and um, seven other countries that are part of Sickle in Africa is to take an integrated approach to the work that we do, combining coordination of activities, providing healthcare, advocacy, research, and training within Africa, and the acronym is CHARTER. And one of the things that I would really like um, to emphasize is how we feel that these five um, areas have to go um, or have to work in an integrated manner, really with the patients and the patient community at the center of all the activities. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Jennifer to give her talk, and I'd really like to um, um, acknowledge the presence of uh, Professor Marina Botto, who's the head of the Department of um, Immunology. Thank you for coming and welcome, Jen. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask Ralph, how do I get my talk up? <laughs> and while I'm waiting for this, hi, Claire. Claire and hi, I worked together so in Seattle for a while. You. So I fun can't to believe see you've you. come to the UK and not come to Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Very wonderful. I'm going to launch this thing now and we can chat later. Um, but so good to see your face. Uh, I really love seeing 
folks that I've worked with before. Um, it's been a great journey. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here today uh, and to share this work with you. Uh, really quickly, I just want to acknowledge that where I work and live in Seattle, Washington, is the unceded ancestral land of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribes. Uh, I want to thank them for their care and stewardship of that land, without which I would not have the place to practice my passion or the opportunity to share it with all of you. Now, I know uh, many of you in the room are familiar with sickle cell disease, but there are definitely some folks online uh, and a few in the audience who are not. And it's really important to acknowledge some of the history of this disease as we talk about why it's so important to make it accessible in areas such as Africa. 1910, sickle cell disease became the very first molecular disease to be reported. And for decades, almost 70 years, uh, it was credited to Dr. James Herrick, who was the attending physician. It wasn't until the late 80s, early 90s that the credit was actually shared with Dr. Ernest Irons, the intern who actually performed that blood analysis, and most importantly, the patient, Walter Clement Noel, who was a dental student in the US at the time. And what they observed under the microscope, or what Ernest observed under the microscope and alerted James to, was these sickle-shaped red blood cells in the upper right-hand corner. Many decades of research, I'm skipping over to tell you that the manifestation of this disease is these rigid sickle-shaped red blood cells that pack in the vasculature and create log jams of all of the blood cells in circulation. And this leads to a number of pathophysiologies and ultimately uh, is fatal in these patients. And this was a, a review that described this in 2018. And we can't talk about genetic therapy without talking about the genetics behind sickle cell disease. There's a lot on this slide, and that's because the genetics of sickle cell disease is actually quite complicated in that there are so many genes for different hemoglobin molecules, and hemoglobin is the protein complex that forms the sickle-shaped red blood cells. In fact, there are two different chromosomes, two different genetics places where these genes are regulated from, and there are a whole host of genes that are expressed in different combinations depending on what stage of development we are in. The graph on the lower left shows you which hemoglobin genes are expressed at which point in time during our development. We have some embryonic hemoglobins that are expressed from conception till about three months of gestation, and then our blood switches over to a fetal hemoglobin or HBF, and we're gonna reference this quite a bit during the talk. That gets expressed until a few months after we're born, at which point our genetic system switches again to adult hemoglobin. And it's the beta unit of that HBA adult hemoglobin which actually carries the sickle mutation. And it's a single base pair in the DNA change, which takes the amino acid in the sixth position from a glutamate to a valine. What this does is create opportunities for different adult hemoglobin complexes to polymerize with each other and then create these long fibers that you see on the right-hand side, which are what provides that rigidity to the red blood cell and creates that sickle shape. It took uh, until the mid-1980s for the United States Food and Drug Administration to approve the first therapy to treat sickle cell disease. And most of the therapies that have been generated, the five that are shown here uh, on the screen, are all just trying to prevent sickling in these patients um, to essentially reduce the number of crises when you create that log jam in the vasculature. The two on the far right actually were just given accelerated approval in the last few years based on some very early data in patients that suggest that they reduce the number of sickling crises but they are gonna be under continued study to see how long that efficacy lasts and how um, true it is. Importantly, none of these are curative therapies. Again, I mentioned they're just preventive, preventive or meant to reduce uh, crises in these patients. They're not cures. There is, however, a cure for sickle cell disease that has been proven, and that's bone marrow transplantation from a person who's unaffected or who has sickle cell trait. Uh, this slide is courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Philip Dorfler at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where the very first transplant of a patient with sickle cell disease happened in 1983, which was actually one year before patients started receiving hydroxyurea. Now, this patient had cancer and sickle cell disease, which is why they were referred for bone marrow transplant. Her brother actually turned out to be a match, and he carried sickle cell trait. And when they transplanted her, not only did the transplant put her cancer in remission, but it also cured her of her sickle cell disease and reverted her red blood cell phenotype to sickle cell trait. The reason this happened is because of that little diagram on the bottom right-hand side of the slide. 
What she received from her brother, brother were blood stem cells, the origin of all blood cells in circulation, including the red blood cells. And her brother's blood stem cells carried sickle cell trait, not sickle cell disease. So they, for the rest of her life, produced cells that were carrying sickle cell trait, and that is what cured her of her sickle cell disease. It was this uh, idea that blood stem cells being transferred could actually improve and even cure patients with sickle cell disease, but it wasn't the first time that we had seen opportunities to change the genetics of patients and see improvement. The second actually came through genetic studies of families and various populations where sickle cell disease in is endemic. And what was found was that there were sometimes kids that should have had sickle cell disease symptoms, but did not. And genetic study identified that these patients not only had the sickle cell mutation, but they also carried other mutations. And that other mutation, a variety of which, large deletions shown on the left, small ones shown on the right, all had the same effect. They somehow stopped that switch from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin shortly after birth. So these patients have a condition called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, meaning that their fetal hemoglobin just doesn't go down, it stays high. And above 20 to 30%, even if these patients also have sickle globin, they don't have sickling and they don't have crises. So these two things combined, that a transfer of stem cells can compensate for red blood cells in a sickle cell disease patient, and also that there are naturally occurring mutations that are tolerated by the body and can compensate or restore hemoglobin function is the impetus for gene therapy to treat this disease. There was a large investment in the US in the last 10 years through the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative and the National Institutes of Health, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that launched an incredible research program to try and look at genetic strategies to um, cure sickle cell disease. And there are currently at least seven clinical trials. There are about 28 total gene therapies in preclinical development. Uh, they're summarized on this slide, which was courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Michelle Satellane at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And they really fall into two categories. Either they try to restore adult hemoglobin by replacing the sickle globin or fixing the exact point mutation, or they compensate for the sickle globin expression by increasing fetal hemoglobin expression. This includes delivery of whole genes using engineered viral vectors, as well as CRISPR-based gene editing studies. And this investment paid off in the US. Very recently, we had two gene therapies, blood stem cell gene therapies, get submitted for approval by the US Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Bluebird Bio's Lova cell on the left, and a combination approach by Vertex Pharmaceuticals and CRISPR Therapeutics on the right. Both of them are compensation strategies. Bluebird Bio actually introduces a, a, a functioning adult non-sickling globin gene using an engineered viral vector. It competes with the sickling globin that's also expressed in these cells. Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics introduce a gene edit using CRISPR that it basically mimics the mutations in HPFH and causes an increase in fetal hemoglobin. And while this was really fantastic and we're starting to see some improvement in the likelihood that we'll have a marketable gene therapy, we can't talk about these without discussing that unfortunately market pricing in the US is not sustainable. Um, they use an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. It's a complicated calculation which says this is how much quality of life for these patients is worth after these treatments and that's what we're gonna base the cost on. And for both therapies, they think about $1.9 million US is fair. This is also for a projected market of 10,000 patients, which is about 10% of the US market of 100,000 patients. And what this ignores completely is that there are actually tens of millions of people living with sickle cell disease, and they don't actually live in the US, they live in the African continent. So this is a large uh, gap in distribution that needs to be addressed. Uh, and we need to think about how we're going to get to these patients. Considering that most of them live on the African continent, you would think that there'd be some work being done to understand the preclinical component or the clinical aspect of these gene therapies. But the answer is that the number of these gene therapies which have been evaluated at all on the African continent is zero. And I acknowledge Julie every time I present the slide because she was the one who came up with this design. And I think it really hits home. There's nothing to put on this slide and we have to change that. So why isn't it being done? Because it's a ridiculously expensive and complicated process, and this is what it looks like, whether you're doing it in an academic institution or you're doing it as a commercial company. This is the same process that Vertex and Bluebird are using. It, I'm not gonna go through all of these steps because it would take the rest of our 30 minute lecture, 
Um, but suffice it to say, one of the biggest issues is the need for ISO class five clean rooms, as well as access to technologies and um, instrumentation that is not for sale or available on the African continent. I wanna say that I've spent a good deal of time there in the last few years, and I have no hesitation in saying that they are absolutely capable of doing everything in this process. They just not have not had the privilege or the ability to be offered the opportunity. So Bluebird and Vertex understand this can't happen at every academic center, so they're following this commercial centralized manufacturing model. What this is going to look like at hospitals such as Hammersmith is that you will collect the blood stem cells from a patient and then you will ship them somewhere. They will get modified, selected, um, and basically qualified for reinfusion, and then they'll get shipped back here for you to infuse in the patient. And this is a model that can scale up to maybe 10,000 patients in the US or in the UK. But it's really important to understand that the transport chain of custody and stability burdens are not sustainable domestically, let alone internationally. And really importantly, this model has not worked to bring other drugs and treatments to the African continent in a reasonable time frame, or in some cases, like in the case of bone marrow transplant at all. So why should we be trying to develop these therapies in Africa? The answer is genetics. These are genetic therapies, genetic and cell-based therapies. They're the underpinning of the success of this approach. And why does that matter? Some people like to say I'm a millennial, I'm a child of the 70s. I like to say I'm a child of the Human Genome Project. I was starting secondary school when it launched in 1990, and I was in the middle of my PhD when it completed the first human genome in 2003. I've been fascinated by the study of the human genome and what it's told us so far. And as I'm following the work that's being done in genomics and taking a career in gene therapy, I'm seeing that there's a disconnect, something that really bothers me that people are not grasping. And it's part of the reason Julie asked me to come and give this talk. Initiatives like H3Africa work to put the sequencing of African genomes into the hands of Africans. In the last 10 years, they've done an incredible job of showing some very important findings that the world needs to pay attention to, especially in regard to genetic therapies. There are many, many papers that have come out of this work, but I'm gonna highlight this one 2020 Nature paper. This paper sequenced the largest number, 426 individuals across 50 ethno-linguistic groups on the continent, and identified more than 3 million undescribed genetic variants relative to every other published human genome to date. That unequivocally tells us that the African continent is the most genetically diverse continent on the planet. And before you think about that genetic diversity as a hindrance, I'd like for you to think about it as an advantage. They also found 62 genomic regions that are under strong selection, meaning the population is moving towards a particular phenotype in that genetic um, space. And these were around immunity to viruses, the ability to repair their own DNA, and the metabolism or the efficiency and function of those cells, all three of which are very critical for whether or not a cell or gene therapy will work. It also showed us unequivocally that all of our human genomes originated on the African continent. It also can show us the timeframes with which individual groups migrated off of the continent. Collectively, what this data tells us is that a gene therapy, especially for diseases that are prevalent in Africa, that works in Africa, is going to be more portable to the rest of the world than for us to develop it here or in the US and try to send it there. Now, my work has been in HIV primarily. And I can tell you that my career took a sharp turn in 2011 when I got asked to translate a phase one clinical trial at an academic center for a gene therapy to treat HIV and cancer. I had translated five uh, different gene therapies at that point, all blood stem cell gene therapies for five different diseases, and I was feeling awesome. All of them looked like that ridiculously complicated process I showed you a few slides ago. And then this trial came, and all of a sudden I had this like huge moral dilemma in my gut uh, that I was going to be building something unrealistic in making a dent in world health. And this is really when I started to shift my mindset and start to think about ways that we could enable access to these therapies in other parts of the world. So I mentioned this complicated process before. I was very familiar with it. 
I decided to take a look and see, okay, what sorts of things, where, you know, do they have access to the drugs we use to get stem cells out of the body? Um, are they doing selection of cells using magnets, which is what we use? Um, is there any evidence for the equipment to do the gene transfer part of the study that we do? Um, what are they using for reinfusion? Do they have the supportive care? And I started asking a lot of different colleagues what was available on the African continent in a number of spaces. And each of the things that's highlighted in a red circle is a place where there is not access to a particular resource or reagent that should have been readily available. And again, it's not capability, it's access to these things that has diminished our ability to develop or encourage development of these therapies there. So I decided that from a place of privilege in the US, I was going to try to help. And these, four, these three purple circles are places where I certainly had a lot of experience. So I looked at some available technologies. Anybody recognize this device? No, that's okay. Clin Clinimax Prodigy, it looks a lot like an apheresis machine. Uh, this is, when we do stem cell transplants, we use a magnet to pull the stem cells out of the blood product uh, in the autologous setting. And this was the second generation of that device produced by a company in Germany called Miltenu Biotech. And they had automated some upfront steps in the process. We were looking at this for something we were trying to do in the US, but I quickly saw that there was a lot of capability here to potentially program this to be a portable clean room and to do the entire manufacturing process in an automated fashion. And I'm not gonna go into all of the details. We published this in Nature Communications in 2016. It was the first example that you could actually do this in a portable setting, uh, that you did not need a clean room, that if you had all the same reagents, you could produce stem cell products equivalently that transplanted into patients. Uh, and we used animal models in this case, just as well as therapies that had been produced in a full scale GMP clean room with all of the bells and whistles. Now, other groups at the same time went on to show that the same device and automation worked in T cell immunotherapies to treat cancer. And the company that produced this machine quickly realized there was a lot more money in cancer than there was in stem cell gene therapies. So our clinical trial, which was the first um, to get this approved, uh, is the only one that's been done to date. There are more than 40 uh, clinical processes that are using this device, all of them for T cell based immunotherapies. But this research getting published is what led to Dr. Sissi Chityo, who's in the center middle left up there, uh, to call me at one o'clock in the morning Uganda time in 2020. It's the pandemic, we're all in isolation, and she's thinking that now's the time for me to do some research on how I could bring gene therapies to my country. And she calls me, I'm in my office, it was in the middle of the afternoon in Seattle because of the time difference, and she just said, I'm really, tired of companies telling us it's not possible. Is there any way we could talk about your approach and maybe get some interest in moving this forward? In several conversations, I quickly realized that there were more barriers than I had planned for in the design of that machine. And she realized that I didn't know anything about what it was gonna actually take to bring gene therapies to Uganda. And we both agreed that actually us being in the same room and talking was probably more helpful than anything else that had happened so far. And that was where the idea for the Global Gene Therapy Initiative was born. We are a grassroots, grassroots network of entirely volunteers that cover every sector of gene therapy development stakeholders, from patients and advocates all the way to commercial developers and regulators. This is just the initial pool of folks. It's too many people now to include everyone on a slide. And importantly, patients are at the center of what we do. This is our International Community Advisory Board. Um, what you will see here is a group of individuals that span both sickle cell advocacy and HIV advocacy. So a question we get asked a lot, sometimes by our own advocates, is why do you have HIV and sickle trying to work together? And the answer is that HIV advocacy absolutely transformed the trajectory of the HIV pandemic. It was advocates pushing governments to generate better therapies that actually met their needs than just scientists achieving what they thought was a big success but didn't really actually help patients. And the result is that now, 40 years after that pandemic has started, we are just starting to see the first cures for HIV Again, coming from individuals who have cancer and HIV and are getting bone marrow transplants. 
We also have treatments available that can give a person with HIV a normal lifespan and keep their viral load undetectable so that they don't transmit to their partners. That is transformative advance and sickle cell advocates have not benefited from the same level of advo advocacy. So putting those advocates together in the same room can teach sickle cell advocates a lot about how to lobby for what they want and they need. At the same time, while there are seven gene therapies for sickle cell disease that are in commercial development in the US, there are 36 for HIV, but we don't have any going to approval yet, partly because the bar is higher. They have to be better than lifelong antiretroviral therapy, which leads to a normal lifespan. And so by paving the way for sickle cell gene therapy in these spaces, we're creating opportunity for HIV gene therapy when it's ready to also have a path already carved. Working together over the last three years, we've identified no matter where you are in the world, you're gonna have different barriers to bringing cell or gene therapy to your space. There are four general categories of things that have to happen simultaneously in parallel. You have to be reaching out to the community to understand what their needs are and what will be acceptable for them when it comes time to adopt a therapy that's available. You have to have the clinical readiness, the training and capacity to actually execute on the gene therapy. No gene therapy in its current state is sustainable. And so we have to be constantly thinking about ways to jump and leapfrog ourselves. In, in the form of new technology. And lastly, you have to have a regulatory pathway for approval. There has to be government policy in place and a regulation stream that allows there to be public trust in the gene therapies that reach the approval stage. We highlighted this in our first working group, which was published in 2021, shown here. And I'm gonna highlight uh, some of our progress to date. So we had a pretty ambitious goal uh, to get a local place of care investigator initiated phase one clinical trial for gene therapy launched at two first time sites, Christian Medical College in Valor, India, and the Joint Clinical Research Center in Kampala, Uganda. Now these two sites self-nominated as part of the GGTI network, but also they are training hubs. So once these sites have the capability of performing these gene therapy procedures or running these trials, they are already built to train other centers in the region to do so. We have started and continue our community outreach and education with our advocates and patients and their caregivers in all of the spaces in which GGTI is operating. It is humbling to hear about the barriers that individuals face. I'm gonna share an anecdote with you on the next slide, which is just a small piece of the many, many times we've been completely flummoxed by responses that we've gotten from patients in different spaces. But what I put this slide up to show you is that there are probably some outreach pictures here that do make some of the people in the room not comfortable um, because it's really important to understand that you need to be communicating in a language that is understandable and representative of the people that you're trying to reach. And that means that it should not be me giving these lectures in Uganda. UK is okay. But it needs to be a Ugandan that's presenting that information. So lots of training and education. So this is an example. Uh, we did a community outreach session and we get asked this question a lot. How are you gonna know that the gene therapy for my sickle cell disease is working? Well, for what got FDA approved in the US, they measure before gene therapy and after gene therapy and they say, are the hemoglobin levels by high performance liquid chromatography at 20% non-sickling globin or HBF relative to what they were before? Is there a reduction in the number of pain crises? Is there a reduction in the number of hospitalizations? And is there a reduced need for RBC exchange transfusion? When we talk to patients in Africa, they don't often get HPLC-based hemoglobin tests. They can get those at clinical centers, but they can't afford to go back and forth to the center every week. They're not managed for pain. There's not a pain center there. They don't hospitalize until their health is dire because it's a self-pay healthcare system. And most of the time, in a lot of places, they don't have access to red blood cell exchange, exchange transfusion. So even when we get a therapy there, we're not gonna be able to measure it on the same terms that we measure it here in the US. And we have to start thinking now about how we're gonna do that differently. And that leads us to one of our 
favorite new technology development stories, uh, Dr. Umit Gherkin at Case Western Reserve University developed a paper-based electrophoresis that can measure hemoglobin levels and types in less than 10 minutes. Right now at $5 a test, we think we can get it down, or he thinks he can get it down. This is the really royal we. Um, he thinks he can get it down to $1 a test. This machine is commercially available now. It's already been placed in some of our clinics in Africa. It's made and um, sold by Hemex Health. What we can be doing right now is purchasing these machines and running them alongside our fancy HPLC clinical tests for hemoglobin to show that they're comparable and equivalent. And then what's going to happen is we're going to shift the field to a cheaper, more affordable, faster test that is also going to make your patients happier. And definitely in the US where you pay by the test, <laughs> right? We're also training the first generation of gene therapists. Uh, pictured on the right is Dr. Lois Baiga, postdoctoral fellow who just did a two-year uh, stint in my lab learning how we do high-income country blood stem cell gene therapy for sickle cell disease. Um, over the last two years, using what she knows about her home country of Uganda, she has developed a modified workflow for this process that will be more amenable to her home site. She just received a travel award and a meritorious abstract award from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, and she's going to present that workflow in a couple of weeks in Los Angeles. And she just received an American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy Underrepresented Minority New Investigator Award, which is going to fund the first two years of her research back in Uganda. And that's another place where all of us can be contributing by training. Not training to say it has to be done this way, but training to say this is one way we do it. I would love your ideas on how else we can make it work. In India, the goal has been met. Vikram Matthews and his team in Valor used the Clinimax Prodigy to start the first CAR T cell trial investigator initiated at the place of care in India. This was a collaboration with Caring Cross, a nonprofit based in the US. And uh, they were able to show that on different continents, using the same reagents and materials, you can produce clinical cell therapy products with essentially the same quality outcomes. In addition to that, they showed that they can do it at a fraction of the cost that we're doing it in the US. Just above that pie chart is a number $35,107 per treatment. That still sounds like a lot of money, and it is. We still need to get it down, but that's in comparison to what we pay in the US, which is about $375,000 per treatment. And that's the lower cost version. And some big wins on the regulation and policy front. Now in India, they already had a regulatory pathway that allowed that trial to get through. In Uganda, there's a lot of work to be done in this space. Big wins by Dr. Chicho and her team were the first organ transplant bill, including bone marrow transplant being passed by the parliament in March of 2022. At the directive of the president, thanks to a lot of lobbying and advocacy by Dr. Chicho and some of her colleagues around what gene therapy is and how it can help patients locally with sickle cell disease and HIV, he required his parliament to review a biotechnology policy this year that will govern genetic editing, both for human health and for agriculture. And the last win was that our conversations in the country had the, got the local WHO office in Uganda to ask the international WHO office for support. And Uganda was named the first test case for the implementation of gene and cell therapy governance. And so they're working with the international WHO to build their regulatory pathway right now. They've already had the first two workshops and we're looking forward to the first governing policy drafts that are gonna come out. There is no better time for all of us to be thinking about this because of COVID. Not just because Sissy called me during COVID, but because COVID-19 underscored how important it is to support local access, especially to things like vaccines and biologics. In fact, the World Health Assembly meeting in Geneva in one month has a priority agenda around promoting local manufacturing for vaccines and biologics for pandemic preparedness. It would be forward thinking and clever to piggyback cell and gene therapy, which is very akin to biologics and vaccines manufacturing on the back of that great work and to leverage things like the new African Medicines Agency to do it at a continental level instead of country by country. And so the GGTI is gonna be doing a lot of advocacy work in the next nine months along this front. And I'm just gonna spend the last minute or two highlighting exactly why. I told you that we had two successes, two approved gene therapies in the US. With those winners in our capitalist society come losers. 
In fact, this is the announcement that came out in February. Three different gene therapy developers just abandoned their pipeline because they lost the race to approval. Not because the therapy's not working, not because it's not safe or not efficacious, but just because they're not going to get enough of the market for it to be profitable. And they're not the only three. There was another one nine months earlier that was actually specifically designed for low resource settings that had also been withdrawn. Now, that's devastating to the sickle cell community. But GGTI sees it as an opportunity. We have a unique point in time where we have a bunch of things that the U.S. doesn't care about that are going to sit on a shelf and probably die on the vine. Now's the time for us to say, why don't we give those technologies to Africa and let them develop them in their own way? They're not going to do it in this complex, ridiculous way that we are. And quite frankly, the ways that they're going to solve the problem and make it work for their patients is probably going to benefit our patients just like that improved hemoglobin test can. Most importantly, that's because I and members of GGTI firmly believe that our best chance for a successful gene therapy to treat HIV or sickle cell disease or any other high index disease in Africa is to have it be made by Africans for Africans. And we just need to facilitate that process. The problems that they solve to make gene therapy a reality on the African continent are going to benefit patients everywhere. And it's time that low and middle income countries were invited into the development pipeline. And with that, I just want to thank all of the partners of GGTI, in particular our patients and community advocates who cross a lot more barriers than we researchers and clinicians do to attend and be part of those meetings and to, to raise their voices. And I want to thank you for your attention. I'm not that tall. She was. Uh, <laughs> Shoot, I, sorry. I can anywhere. So, um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. That was superb. Um, that was superb because um, uh, you really touch at very sensitive area and in terms of who needs it and how can they get it. And, and that is, um, and, and you talked about um, global Africa, and actually, I'm also talking about. Um, the United Kingdom, and we still have issues with access, and we also have some challenges. So, but we're trying to kind of share some of the examples of how we try to address this. And we have um, uh, the arrangement of the health services in the UK or in England allow us to have networks of services, networks of, of centers that actually, uh, so we call them specialty treatment, treatment centers, and then this the treatment center actually then come together and as a coordinating center. There are 10 coordinating centers for sickle cell disease, and there are four for thalassemia. And uh, so these centers come together as a panel, and we work together in order to look at uh, complex patients, patients that need various treatments, and actually the patients that you're talking about are some of the ones. So this is the panel that allows us to bring all the expertise together, um, and uh, we have um, all the expertise that would be able to contribute to a discussion on complex patients. How do we decide who gets what treatment? Because you mentioned the aspect in terms of how is it funded and who funds it, but actually how do we get policy to actually come and participate? And we are very grateful that we do have this kind of opportunity uh, to discuss our patients in that way. And the system includes the, um, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the the national panel, but also the clinical reference group, uh, which is uh, has a strategy in terms of funding across um, specialty of hemoglobinopathies, that is sickle cell disease, thalassemia, and rare anemias. Uh, and so all of this come within that particular uh, system. And, um, and, and so some of the conditions are actually indicated here, and, and we have uh, different people that actually have a different contribution. So the, uh, the, the NHP, is, NHP is meant to coordinate um, and, and coordinate the work together and uh, share the best practices but also provide training and also provide uh, access to understanding what is going on in terms of research, what is going on in terms of education, and actually try and support patients uh, and also uh, professionals 
particularly professionals that probably have very little contribution in terms or really interest in hemoglobin. And we want to make sure that there is a, a common understanding to some of the key things. And you might probably have been aware of the No One Is Listening report, uh, which uh, came out on the 15th of November uh, 2021, uh, which showed that even the simple management with pain killers in the hospital, a patient actually, uh, for example, the patient that uh, was a key patient uh, had to call the ambulance, even though he was in hospital, and then we we'll say, okay, what was the failing in the system? And that has led to quite some significant changes and, and certain things that we want to celebrate as major changes that are happening. And so we allow, allow us to come together as experts to discuss these patients, and these patients are presented. And what are the kind of patients that we see and discuss in this panel? So we have a monthly um, meeting to discuss this patient, but also in between we have uh, emergency email that allow us to discuss patients who have urgent care. So if you look at some of the cases that we see and we discuss at these panels, uh, include sickle cell disease, thalassemia, but because of numbers, so in, in the UK there are about 14,000 to 17,000 patients with sickle cell disease and thalassemia is about 1,000 patients. So, and then other conditions are, are PKD, D and, and the rest of them. So this actually are the reason the one referred to this panel. And the panel is not only hematologists, pediatricians, but also the panel has um, uh, specialists in nephrology, orthopedics, and also immunology, uh, so that they can make a contribution to discuss exactly what happened to these patients. Uh, so you can look at the majority of patients uh, previously were actually tele um, for bone marrow transplantation. Uh, so indication for bone marrow transplantation. It's easier for us to make a decision about adult bone marrow transplantation because the indication is very clear. Uh, so the current protocol, there are two protocols. One is allows uh, transplantation. You know, the sibling match donor, I have enough uh, reasons for that to be actually kind of approved. And also there's now um, a haplomatch protocol that is actually coming into, into, into force as well. In pediatrics, it's much more challenging exactly which patient do you, do you transplant, particularly if you do not have a sibling match donor. Which patient could you send for a haplomatch protocol, alternative donor? So those are some of the things. So we have this extensive discussion to say, okay, who do we decide to approve bone marrow transplantation based on the haplo protocol? And would you go for a HAPA protocol or would you go for gene therapy? And, and that is something that is really kind of very big for us. So really talking about this and, to, and we're looking forward to the possibility of the intravenous or I mean the, 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 in, the in, vivo, in vivo gene therapy, uh, yeah. whether that is something that also will benefit from. But actually currently in the UK, um, there is uh, one of the gene therapies, particularly the biotech is actually undergoing uh, some evaluation by the NICE, because NICE is the one that recommends treatment. Um, so I, I thought maybe it would be nice to just say, actually the case is very important for Africa, and that's, I do have my heart there, <coughs> but actually also is an issue that we can talk about here in, in the UK. So uh, thank you for an excellent presentation, and I hope and I know it's going to generate so much discussion. Julie, thank you. By the way, absolutely, uh, it's good for you to, I mean, I can see uh, uh, Lu Lucio Dusato. I was a student here in 1992, and he was my professor. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Baba. Um, the, okay, so then we have uh, some remarks from uh, Caroline Kruschenbacher at um, Genomics England. So I'll stop sharing our screen and then hopefully Caroline will be able to join. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Couldn't be there in person. Okay, let's echo. Uh, I shared my slide before, but if you prefer, I can just screen share. Okay. Should I? Uh, yes, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, sorry, I sent a bit late. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks so much um, for giving me a little bit of space in this really um, amazing talk series today. Um, so I am very pleased to announce that Genomics England and NIH Bioresource are coming together to run the first national program on genomics in, in sickle cell disease. Um, genomics England is the organization that delivers whole genome sequencing diagnostics for the National Health Service in, in England. And um, 
We recently launched an initiative called Diverse Data that aims to reduce health inequalities and improve outcomes for genomic research and um, medicine for minoritized groups in England. In order to achieve this really broad objective, the, the one condition that emerged very clearly as heavy as being massively under-researched relative to the immense burden of the disease in, in England and globally is obviously sickle cell disease. So um, we, we still don't fully understand the, the immense variability in clinical manifestations between patients. And Jennifer's talk has illustrated really wonderfully how powerful genomic approaches can be both in, you know, understanding causes for variability and developing new therapies. And that's why we want to really make the most out of genomic technologies and um, working with NIHF Bioresource are now um, putting together the first national program that aims to offer participation in this research effort to every single sickle cell patient in England. Um, once, hopefully this has been achieved, that those data will be available to every researcher um, in, in England and globally in order to really maximize the, the benefits and the insights that can be gained from this. And um, I'm also here because we are extremely keen to work with experts, clinicians, patients, both within England and internationally, in, in order to ensure that this program will a, address the, the key questions that are still open in the field, but also demonstrate the importance of doing more research in, in this disease. So the main aims are to drive improvements in health outcomes for sickle cell patients by building a world leading sickle cell genomics research platform and develop research priorities that are set by people affected by sickle cell disease and raise awareness of sickle cell and advocate for better patient centered research treatments and care. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Um, at this juncture, I'd like to invite Adam, who's uh, <laughs> sorry to spring this on you, who's the uh, one of the London patients of the GGTI. Um, so uh, to make a few comments, and then we can get going with the discussion uh, segment. Yeah. Hi. So um, um, everybody knows I'm the London patient. I was treated here in 2016 for a bone marrow transplant. So I was I eradicate HIV and then cure my cancer. So um, I was talking yesterday with Jennifer about my experience, how I learned about sickle cells during this um, my journey, because I said to her, I was in a I was in my cancer bubble because the only thing I knew was I'm here in Hammersmith just for cancer. But um, or in my journey, one day I have to go for emergency to go back here. Um, I was sent to our unit in Fraser and Gamble. It was my first experience when I arrived into the unit. Um, I saw a lot of people screaming, shouting, a lot of people in pain, agony, and I, I was, you know, I was ill, but I, I, I was not aware of my surrounding. I'm thinking, what I'm in this unit. That's what I think, took it to myself. And then I realized, thing, oh, but I, I realized everybody in the in the war, it was black. And I'm thinking, something happened here. I don't know what is understand. I asked the nurse, can what I'm here are because you had a blood disease. That's what they're here for. You are part of the, the same team. And I thought like, what? I, it's sickle cells. It was the first time I learned or oh, discover about sickle cell. It was my ignorance and admitted I didn't know about sickle cells. And I see a lot of patients side by side in the unit in Casual Lewin Center, which are in sickle cell units, but I didn't know because I saw everybody it was on cancer. It was I was in the hematology bubble because that's because I struggled for that. So for me it was I had to learn, I had to Google it. I start learning and I, I see people's pain and when I realized if for me, 
HIV and cancer were a death sentence, but people for sickle cell is a life sentence. They have to live with that the rest of their life and they have no possibilities like we have. And then to discover transplant is possible in sickle cell, it's like, wow, and gene therapy can help. And I thought, wow, we have to, I have to be passionate as well because if we are human beings and we need to help each other. For me, it was um, kind of a learning curve, but I, I had to learn in the hard way because I didn't know anything. Um, the nurses didn't explain too much to me, but then I have to I start talking to the patients next to me and they tell me this is harsh for me, it's hard, it's difficult, and um, people don't understand it because for the first time somebody told me, oh, this is a black disease. And I was, wow, it was like, for me, it was so much learning and understanding their frustration, their challenges. And I look at myself, oh, I don't have that problem. Why should I care? I thought, no, because we are human beings and they have, we have the compassion to help. I come from the perspective of HIV with um, the proof of concept, we can cure HIV. I know it's, it's not feasible for everybody because it's complicated as we know, but it's a, it's a door, it's an opportunity for that. So when a team with Sisi, um, we were in IS uh, conference and she asked me publicly to, to be part of the GTI initiative, I said, of course, because it's important to help because somehow 20 years ago, scientists decided to start working in, in the program on what I'm alive today, what I know push and help others because I want to help. I think um, it's different between um, the demographics in HIV is the same with sickle cells. And I want to help. So it was very inspiring for me to, to learn more because in the last couple of years, I become, I have to learn about cancer. I have to learn about HIV a lot and I'm learning about sickle cells. So I'm I cannot try to educate other people with my knowledge uh, in a more simple way. So thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Adam. That was fantastic. And uh, I think it relates to something that we've uh, picked up on with the um, sickle cell patient advocacy groups that HIV gets relate, uh, talked about quite a lot. Um, uh, as a kind of um, a starting point in terms of how we can improve things uh, with regards getting patients involved. So uh, at this juncture, it's the time for a bit of uh, discussion slash any questions you have for the people who've uh, uh, given talks. And I note that Indu uh, with uh, Welsh hat on slash uh, Scottish in my case, uh, a question maybe for Caroline uh, is, are there any plans to extend the genomic studies to the devolved nations? So, un unfortunately, the the realm and the funding of Genomics England is is England, and this is partially due to the way the healthcare system is split um, in England. So, it would be, I mean, hopefully, eventually, a collaborative effort, but it wouldn't be led by the same organisation. Yeah, important point. Equally, the world. I mean, ideally, it would be a global effort, but yeah. Do I need to press it on? It's on. Can you hear me okay? So, Caroline, uh, one follow on to that um, Is there going to be an initiative to um, prioritize? Um, immigrant or underrepresented minority genomes in the UK genomics study, because that's one way to get at it uh, if you can't use the money outside of the country. Um, yes, absolutely. So the the diverse data initiative was actually was, is not originally focused on sickle cell per se. And one of the earlier proposals was just to, to diversify and um, from our perspective, it is irrelevant whether what sub passport somebody has or not, they, as long as they are um, in the healthcare system. So there are several other projects as part of this. All, all have a clinical focus, though, I, I should say, 
that really recruit diverse other groups. For example, around maternal health, we do um, we do have another large project. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's a huge um, there's a huge underrepresentation and. So we, we often say just in, in your service, ask the question, uh, who who does my approach not serve? And I think the answer right there was people who aren't in the healthcare system. And they're probably the individuals that you need to get the most coverage for. Um, so I don't I don't have an answer for you, but I think creative solutions to reach out to those communities because part of understanding what they would need to participate in the genomic study is also answering the question of what barriers they have to cross to be part of the healthcare system. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, these are partially practical requirements of um, of the way Genomics England works. So the data that we have and that will be made available uses healthcare record linkage. And um, but you are right. I think beyond this particular initiative, it is extremely important to think much more broadly about people who are underrepresented, people who are, you know, maybe not even registered, who don't have an address. And um, this is an extremely important and, and wide field that needs a lot more work doing. Hi, Caroline. Uh, Caroline. Um, I just question, you know, you talk about raising awareness about thicker cells. You know, I'm coming from the HIV perspective. So I have a plaque from us, the London patients, so people know about HIV. But I don't see anybody on the in the thickerfell field in it, who can represent or the voice because I you know I cannot do that because I'm, I'm, I can I cannot represent thicker cells because I will be like a fraud because I'm not have a disease and I only I can talk about all my experience. So, but I don't see anybody representing that. And do you have any ideas or any proposal for that? Because for me, it would be important to kind of team with that person or get strategy for that, but I, I would like to hear on that for you. Yeah, really important question. So we are teaming up um, with a bunch of organizations, but in particular the Sickle, Sickle Society in the UK, and they are much better placed. So they work with a number of different patients who they have very good long-standing contacts with. Um, and so that's that's one way, but we also have patients who work directly but you're right, it's not a single individual who can represent all of the cell. Absolutely not. Uh, actually, I didn't want to address that, but I just I agree with Tab, but uh, it's, it's, there is a very clear voice for sickle cell disease in the UK. We're also struggling to get a global sickle cell voice, and there are a lot of efforts really to doing that. So we do have a really a development going forward in terms of both Europe and Africa and globally as well. But my question is to Jennifer. Okay. Do you have advocates? Um, do you in the in the UK have um, patients who have received either bone marrow transplant or gene therapy that could work with Adam and Victoria Gray and others to talk about their experience before, during, and after both you know those two curative therapies? Um, so I'm leading um, an initiative which is called uh, Sickle Cell Improvement in London, and um, that the guy chairing, uh, Ralph, is actually very one of the key people in driving that initiative. And on, on the 3rd of July, we'll have an event that actually share um, the experience of different people and how they actually can come together to make changes. And this is going to happen in the parliament on the 3rd of July, and I will invite you to attend. And so back to my question for Jennifer. Uh, this is a very standard question, a very standard question, okay, you will experience, and that is the um, the conflict between um, the generality of patients and the minority of patients, and where do you direct your resources? But I can see in your slide, you said one of the qualifications for centers to actually be considered was the provision of things like epheresis. So I think the two can be combined. That is meeting the need the pain management of patients in asking an emergency and also the provision of standard care and yet driving the initiative. So how do you want to respond to address that to the Minister of Health in Nigeria? 
this is my favorite kind of question to answer because I get to defer to Julie, uh, who's done an incredible amount of work. There's a tremendous amount of effort to make centralized centers of excellence for sickle cell disease treatment across the continent. And Julie's excellently positioned. Thank you. So I think that was a, um, yeah, um, Baba and I last week were at WHO Afro in, in, in Congo, Brazzaville, where they're developing a, um, a guidance framework for treatment centers and centers of excellence. One of the things that we've been doing in um, some of the African countries that are part of Sickle in Africa, as well as part of Sickle Charter, is first of all identifying from the, the you know the many sickle cell patients that that are there that come to the clinic identify those that um, have indications for what we call advanced therapy so these are uh, patients who need exchange blood transfusion and bone marrow transplant but also who would benefit from um, hydroxyurea so the majority of patients in um, um, Tanzania are not yet on hydroxyurea about 40 percent of them are um, but we need to optimize the, the the access to hydroxyurea in these patients. And then for those who require exchange transfusion and bone marrow transplant, then we start HLA typing them, preparing them for that. So we're doing that in Tanzania. Colleagues are doing that in Nigeria. And so these will be the centers that will be um, ready and, and Uganda as well. So at JCRC, they, they're also doing exchange transfusion. So these are the centers that are already starting to participate in preclinical um, research on stem cells, as well as um, readiness for, for um, gene therapy for sickle cell disease. And then to just follow on that, um, we think about how important it is to have a cure. Not that, you know, everyone's going to want it or that it's going to be able to reach everyone. But when it's on the table, when it's a choice, it changes how patients perceive their health care. When you're told you have this disease, here's some medication, it's going to delay the inevitable. And unfortunately, you're not going to live very long. What is the incentive for them to come back? But when you say here's a one-time intervention that's curative and that's on the table, all of a sudden, lots of other things come in line. We, we get a question a lot, how can you justify devoting resources towards gene therapy, which is so far off when we don't even have care for hydroxyurea and access to red blood cell exchange transfusion, and that is our answer. When patients have a choice and the cure is one of those choices, all of the other treatments fall in line. Okay, th thank you everyone for that excellent discussion and the questions and points raised. So uh, we'll move on now to the closing remarks from uh, Professor Tassos Karadim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for getting together for this uh, uh, fantastic event, which was organized at a very short notice. Uh, and that's the reason we're missing the presence of some very distinguished colleagues, which would have given us uh, their insight into uh, uh, this uh, discussion. Well, thank you very much first to Jenny, who stopped by at the short notice again uh, to uh, 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 bring this discussion to us with a lot of enthusiasm and commitment. And uh, and of course, that was facilitated by Julie McCanny. Uh, so there's been a good uh, uh, really meeting of, of of uh, the moons are there. Um, of course, we uh, uh, at Hammersmith, we have a very proud tradition in, uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, serving our local community, uh, which is of Afro-Caribbean origin uh, primarily, and, and uh, uh, providing care in the community and also hospital care uh, uh, for, for our patients. And also we've taken pride in the fact that we have pioneered a lot of the treatments in sickle cell disease, um, uh, starting from, of course, hydroxyurea, uh, bone marrow transplantation uh, pioneered by Professor Irene Roberts uh, many years ago, and I happened actually to work with her in transplant work uh, when I was training at the time, and she's sending her actually apologies, she couldn't be here today. And that, of course, was continued uh, then uh, very ably and uh, imaginatively by uh, uh, Professor Mark Layton, who also cannot be here today. He has a very important business uh, actually around sickle cell uh, work and uh, 
funding of it um, uh, uh, currently, and more recently by uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen O'Coley, who uh, did his PhD with me. Uh, and of course, behind all that and all of these people and all of this idea was one person uh, and one uh, 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 mentor, colleague and friend, friend uh, Lucio Luzzato, who inspired us actually to carry on uh, uh, caring uh, about uh, really uh, our patients with sickle cell disease, not only locally in our sort of local community, uh, but internationally and more specifically in Africa because of his own African legacy. And uh, that's really the meaning of uh, Julie being with us here for one year uh, as a visiting professor, the provost visiting professor, uh, whose um, really uh, task here uh, is to bring the reality of sickle cell disease from Africa uh, and uh, see how uh, the reality of sickle cell disease uh, research, care, treatment, and of course cure, and cure now is possible. Uh, parenthetically, uh, 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 my colleague Joshua Lafuente has led the gene therapy trials here at Imperial, and we cured two patients with sickle cell disease by gene therapy. Uh, so that is happening, uh, but I agree. Uh, uh, we, we need to make that uh, possible where it is needed most. And when I first heard again about the idea of gene therapy for sickle cell disease, it was 30 years ago by Lucio Luzzato, and we thought, hmm, that doesn't look very realistic. And now I think we see, if I think, and many think, uh, people think like yourselves, actually is the most realistic approach uh, uh, for treatment of uh, sickle cell disease in Africa. So we ascribe to all these ideals and we'll see with um, uh, Julie how we uh, will be able to help in that direction. And not only that, uh, this has also triggered another uh, uh, area of interest uh, around multiple myeloma, uh, which is the most common malignancy uh, in people of African ancestry. And we strongly believe that also has a genetic basis. And we're working with Julie and uh, other colleagues in Africa to see how we can uh, really explore um, uh, uh, possi similar possibilities of uh, research, diagnosis, and treatment of multiple myeloma uh, in Africa. Uh, 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 but we're at early stages. But we will learn from what is happening in sickle cell disease. So uh, thank you very much for all this. has been very inspiring and instructive. But I cannot finish really uh, myself. I cannot be the last person. The last person, the last, wo last world, the word should be from Lucio Luzzato. Professore, is yours. Well, uh, I, I'm uh, I, I'm uh, taken aback. Uh, I, I I was not on the program, and uh, I uh, I am amazed by uh, the ability that you that you all have had to put together uh, such a wonderful meeting, uh, spanning uh, from um, uh, awareness of patients, as we heard. Uh, to um, uh, epidemiology, uh, to uh, innovative therapies of all sorts. Uh, so uh, for me, yes, you're right, uh, Tassos. Um, I, I was um, um, in 1981 um, in, in a paper envisaging uh, gene therapy and now for sickle cell disease. And now uh, we are witness to this, to this, to this, to this. Um, we are witness to the fact uh, that it's possible. Uh, but I would like particularly uh, to say that it was my stay of seven years in Tanzania with Julie McCanny uh, that has brought me uh, to the understanding of the dynamics today, which is very different from what it was 40 years ago, uh, because um, the uh, the before there was a gap in uh, specialization, there was a gap almost in culture, uh, and now uh, that gap is filled. Uh, we have a number, a considerable number of trained hematologists in Tanzania and in many other African countries, uh, as was said before, who can do the job. And uh, therefore, uh, the urgency uh, to do this uh, is uh, much greater than it was before. And um, uh, I do hope that initiatives like this 
uh, will uh, translate uh, into, um, yes, as Julie said, the whole gamut um, uh, from uh, the uh, necessity to give modifying treatments like hydroxyurea to all uh, and uh, to identify uh, that subset where, where bone marrow transplantation and or gene therapy uh, can be made available uh, in Africa. Uh, so, uh, well, to me, uh, be, before uh, 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 my uh, scientific children and grandchildren uh, have grown up, I'm very proud to see uh, that they will, they will bring this to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, I think that is the last word uh, from us. Ralph, back to you to close the meeting. No, it's left to me then to, ah, here you are, yes. Unmute yourself. We're muted folks, sorry. Uh, thank you everyone who's contributed today, but obviously most of all to Jennifer for your excellent talk. And um, uh, also thank you to everyone who attended the meeting as well. And hopefully we'll be having more of these kind of uh, international events in the non-too distant future. So thank you everyone. Hope you have a fantastic evening and weekend.